free-flowing creeks are part of what binds ecosystems together. These waterways are the circulatory systems of our landscapes. There is approximately 67 tributaries in the lower Hudson River watershed. Half of those are dammed. These are not those giant structures out west, the Elwha Dam, the Hoover Dam. These were mill dams, and they were much smaller. The vast majority of these dams are outdated, outmoded, and serve no viable purpose anymore. They're essentially obsolete. We at Riverkeeper feel they should be removed. The first problem with dams is they bisect habitat. They block historic flows of water, they block sediment, and they block nutrient flow. All these are important for food chains all along the reaches. Dams have to be maintained. You have to constantly repair them, and somebody has to pay for them. It's generally more expensive to repair a dam than to remove it. These dams are aging. If you think about a dam and what the life of a dam will be, you have three trajectories. Either you repair and maintain the dam, you remove the dam, or eventually it, it progressively fails and collapses and crumbles on its own. In the estuary program, we believe that dams that aren't serving a purpose anymore are biologically important. We would like to help remove them. So what happens when you take the dam away? Will there be any water left? Well, all you have to do is go just downstream of any dam or upstream of any dam, and you'll see what used to be there. So take a walk up beyond the pond or down below the dam, and you'll see what is a stream or a river, which essentially is what it used to look like. Not all dams are bad. There's a lot of dams that serve very, very good purposes and are necessary, but We've had over, uh, you know, we've had centuries of dam buildings, and there are some that are anachronistic. There are some that have outlived their usefulness, and there are some that are even hazards. So thinking hard about how we keep streams connected together, thinking hard about right-sizing culverts, about taking down or adjusting dams that may no longer be of use, that's really important both for us as a human society and also for this whole ecosystem of the watershed estuary connection. I've been removing dams for, what, maybe 25, 30 years now, and most of what I'm working on are old relic industrial dams. The industries stopped 50 years ago. And I think most people who think of what I do for a living assume I'm like an explosives expert, that I go and I blow up these dams all the time, but that's not really the case. It's pretty rare that we blow up a dam. Most of the time we're just bringing in the big yellow equipment. We wait till the flows are really, really low in the, in the river for the most part. And then we go in with the mechanical equipment and we slowly lower it while controlling the flows at the same time. We need dams for things like uh, water supply or flood control, um, but there's a lot of dams in the rivers that aren't serving a purpose anymore. There's a lot that have just are remnants of this industrial legacy. It's interesting to think what now looks kind of like a grown over forest um, had a lot of structures here at one point, had a lot of buildings, had people taking their lunch, had, you know, with their lunch pails and everything else, but, but now it's been kind of just left. Some of the dams have already collapsed and then some haven't. And so we get this kind of mix match of history on these sites. So this barrier is quite a bit smaller than the one we were just at, but this is actually the first barrier on the system. So right now, this might as well be Hoover Dam to the fish 
get up to the base of this, and we can actually see herring at the base right now. They get stopped right here. They never make it up to the base of the next dam. In tracking some of the case histories of our losses of these fish in rivers, like the Susquehanna River, for instance, which was the premier shad river on the East Coast, those populations went from the tens of millions to less than 100 some years reaching the spawning grounds. That's a five order of magnitude decline. When the colonists first came here from Europe, they were blown away by what they saw in our fresh waters. Remember that Europeans were coming from a continent, even in the 1600s, that had been heavily overfished, uh, over timbered, just overused environmentally for, for centuries. The Europeans were astounded by what they saw. Uh, the, the quotations are actually quite inspiring to see. I mean, it, it's, they're not quantitative, but they tell you that they were simply wowed by, by what they saw. They talked about walking dry shot across the backs of these fishes, which is an exaggeration, but it just tells you that there were an awful lot of fish there in those days. One of the cool uh, things that if you're really lucky, you might get to see even here in the Hudson Valley are small eels climbing up waterfalls or the faces of dams, trying to get upstream, trying to find habitats where they can settle in and mature. And it doesn't seem possible that these fish are climbing up wet rocks, but I've seen it myself and it's a pretty awesome sight. Even though eels can, can sometimes get around or ascend dams, anytime you have a barrier to migration, you're going to be limiting some of those animals, some of that connectivity between upstream and downstream. All right, dump them in there. And remember, even though, yeah, sure, a few eels can get above those dams, that's a food source for the upriver ecosystem that those dams may be preventing and limiting. Uh, another factor that I think does not get enough attention is that many of the dams in the Hudson Valley and the entire Northeast are aging and are already beyond their expected life period. So we should be thinking about the future of these rivers also in relation to the sheer safety factor of these dams, which uh, are not going to last forever and have a finite existence. You would have thought we'd had a uh, full life cycle process, an economic process that included that full life cycle for a dam, but that's not what happened. So we had something built, we had it used, it served an economic purpose, and, and it was built on a public trust resource. So it was built on a resource that was for everyone. But then there was no funding source put in to the end of its life, to what was gonna happen in the end. And unlike a building kind of rotting in place, let's say, in the center of a town um, that really becomes a nuisance and a hazard. Uh, and then at some point, the owner of that building is really responsible for taking that out. That's not what has happened on rivers. We've had these just left uh, 50, 100 years ago and just kind of rotting on their own. And the industry's long gone. These are the ghosts of capitalism past people made their fortunes and abandoned them. They are now an ecological problem that we have to resolve. In places like Newburgh, there are a series of dams, and it could all be within a few blocks, one after another. Each person, each mill wanted a dam, and they wanted their certain amount of water. And so these now represent uh, bona fide obstacles. So if you remove one, there's one behind it. And then there's another, and then there's another. So we have to engage the community one dam at a time. A lot of the films and a lot of the publicity about dam removal are the big west coast dams. And they're huge dams, Hoover Dam and others. Huge dams. And a 10-foot dam blocks fish just as much as a 500-foot dam. You can prioritize dams 
and sort them a whole bunch of different ways. You could sort them by which is the most hazardous. You could sort them by which dam owner is most likely to let the dam go. Of course, the best way for the fish's point of view is to say which dams are going to benefit aquatic life the most. extraordinarily expensive to fix when the time comes to fix it. But sooner or later, the fish will win. Sooner or later, it's coming down because nobody's going to spend $10 million to fix this dam. Not going to happen. And uh, so sooner or later, the fish are going to win. It's just a matter of time. Kill, which is about three miles south of Troy, which is the end of the estuary. It was a heavy industry here. And this little tributary comes in from the east. And for 15 years, and I'd been looking at a dam that I thought was a concrete wall, immovable structure. You know, we've been talking to New York State DEC estuary program for years about their initiative to take down barriers for fish migration. And in May 2016, the city of Troy came down here and it took a loader and a cutting torch and the barrier that had been there for 85 years was gone. Five days after it came down, they put a camera in the water right here behind me and there were herring coming up the wine is killed. They had reached the spawning ground and they were going to fulfill their destiny. And when you think about what's happening here in these migrations, is these fish are born in the upper Hudson. They had left when they were this big years ago. They came back on faith, driven by forces that are beyond all of our understanding. And they found that fast water coming over the dam. And fast water to them says a, a tributary. We want to go in there. We want to get above the tide. We want to get away from the predators. So for 85 years, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, their great 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 grandparents have been coming up and knocking on the door at that dam. Nobody home. A lot of times people thank us at Riverkeeper, you know, they'll say, oh, thank you, you're doing God's work. Well, when we took down that barrier, we were part of it. We felt like we were doing God's work. It's a uh, a wondrous thing to be involved in something like that. Um, it was the first barrier in the history of the Hudson Valley removed expressly for fish passage. The dams were all built one at a time. They're gonna come down one at a time. 